So when we were talking about coupling constants, I said sometimes there are some really big differences between coupling constants, distinct differences between coupling constants. So like in alkenes, if you have a cis coupling, your J3HH is about 10 hertz. If you have a trans coupling, your J3HH, that's your three bond coupling or your vicinal coupling is about 17 hertz. And by the way, I will again caution you to make sure you understand the difference between coupling through a double bond versus coupling between double bonds. So a lot of people, particularly when they are starting out, confuse stereochemistry with conformation. You can rotate about single bonds. So even if you have a bond between two single bonds that might be S cis or S trans, that's always a dynamic equilibrium. It may be heavily weighted toward one way, but that's not stereochemistry, that's conformation. And that, mind you, has a different carpless curve than the carpless curve for an sp2, sp2 carbon pair that's connecting two hydrogens. So anyway, this is specifically not on here, but let's now talk about cyclohexane, which is what I'm going to choose for today's, today's lecture, and just remind us of some of the key features I pointed out. Previously, we talked about the carpless curve for SP3, SP3 systems, and we said that there are some very distinct relationships that are, that are in cyclohexane. So 180 degrees gives you a big coupling constant, a 60 degree relationship gives you a small coupling constant. So our axial, axial coupling has a 180 degree dihedral relationship. Those of you who saw the previous sophomore class that was just filing out got to see Hannah talking about Newman projections, and if you Newman project, you have a 180 degree dihedral angle, and typically you have about eight to 10 hertz for an axial-axial coupling. If you have an axial-equatorial coupling, these are of course all three bond couplings, or an equatorial-equatorial coupling, you have a 60 degree dihedral angle, and you remember the carpless curve that I drew out before, and so that's about two to three hertz for each of those. So what I'm going to do right now is pass out a, or, or mention a very real example that just came up in my lab, and I thought it would make a cool, cool example for spec, and it was a stereochemical problem associated with a conjugate addition to a, an alpha, beta, unsaturated nitro compound. So we were working with nitrocyclohexene, the nitrocyclohexene is electrophilic at the beta position, and we were doing an addition of aniline, I'll write that as PHNH2, to give the addition product like so. And so the issue here was whether we have the trans product or the cis product. And so of these two stereoisomers, what do we call the relationship between these stereoisomers? Diastereomers. So of these two diastereomers, each of them, of course, is formed as the racemate. 
And that doesn't matter because you can't tell one enantiomer from another by NMR. The spectrum of a racemic mixture is identical to the spectrum of either an individual enantiomer, unless you have some sort of chiral solvent, or unless I prepare a chiral derivative. So the only way I could distinguish these two apart would be, say, to make an amide, the two enantiomers apart, would be to make an amide where I had a chiral acid brought in to make an amide, or to use something like a chiral shift reagent or a chiral solvating agent. So the big question is which of these two is formed, the cis or the, cis or the trans? And I want to pass out the spectrum. And we'll take a look and analyze it. And I have a few extras here. Anyone else? Uh, one more back here. Great. All right, great. So we have here the NMR spectrum in chloroform solution. And what I've done here is I've blown up this region, the midfield region. So we call this region the downfield region, this real reason, region the upfield region, and I'll call this the midfield region. So our molecule, of course, is nit has a phenyl group in it. And so I think it's pretty obvious that our phenyl group is over here. You might notice, for example, if you look at the phenyl group, that we have something that looks like a doublet. Or an apparent doublet. That corresponds to the orthoprotons. There may be some metacoupling going on there. We're not going to be talking in any great detail about this, but I just want you to get in the habit of always reading your spectrum. So that corresponds to the ortho. We see something that looks like a triplet that's the same integral. If you notice, the height in the integral from here to here is identical from the height from here to here. So that triplet or apparent triplet corresponds to the metaprotons, and there are two of those. And then we see something that looks like a triplet over here. And again, it's either a triplet or an apparent triplet, or there's some small additional coupling. So I'll say HM. And that corresponds to the paraproton. Now, I don't know if you can see on here, but you certainly can see on yours. Do you notice? Where the orthoproton and the metaproton uh, and the uh, and the paraproton show up? What's their chemical shift roughly? Six point six, six point seven. I said aromatics are typically seven to eight. Do you know why they're a little upfield? Nitrogen donation. So the electrons pushing in from resonance off of the nitrogen. By resonance, we get extra electron density at the ortho position and the para position, and so that ring is shifted a little bit upfield, which is kind of cool. If I made an amide out of that nitrogen, which would pull electron density out, these guys would scoot over a little more downfield. 
And here, this little guy over here, this is your chloroform peak. All right. All of this is all of the other cyclohexyl stuff. that are not directly involved. And then we have three peaks in the midfield region. Remember right now, we don't know the stereochemistry and we don't yet know what's what. Why do we have three peaks? The NH. So we have these two protons and the NH. Something very interesting happened with this sample, and this wasn't anything that I had planned on. It was simply the day, a day later I went to rerun the sample, same sample, and the midfield region looked a little bit different. So this is your day old day old sample. This is the freshly prepared sample. What's going on there? So we still see it. So James said the nitrogen is swapped with deuterium. So we still see it, but now it's broad. What does that tell us? Maybe moist. If it were very, very wet, you see this peak over here? So this is, and the sample was nicely sealed. So this little peak here at 1.6 is H2O. That's about where you see it, 1.6, 1.56. That's very typical for H2O and chloroform. So we don't have a lot of water in there, probably about 10 millimolar, 20 millimolar water. And we have lots and lots of sample. Now, what else did I tell you about chloroform? Can generate HCl, and a little bit, even a little bit, that forms is going to catalyze the acceleration, the exchange of NHs between molecules or between molecules and water. So even if you form just a little bit, 1%, for example, of I guess it would be DCL, but the majority, of course, if it's 1% of, you know, of your molecule, one mole percent, the majority is still HCL. But what's happening is now your NHs, instead of saying attached to the same molecule, are getting swapped between molecules. And as a result, in this case, it's also getting swapped with water. But as a result, if that proton doesn't stick around for tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds, you can't see the spin as to whether it's spin up or spin down. So we lose coupling. It becomes a singlet, in this case a broad singlet. Now let's look at these patterns here in the un unexchanged sample. So these are all the Midfield. So which one's the, the NH over here? 3.4-ish. The doublet is the NH. And so the other two, and we'll talk more about this in a moment, but the other two, one of them changes a little bit in pattern visibly. All right, let's Let's talk now about what we call these patterns. So what do we call this pattern? We saw it last time. It's a triplet of doublets. You have two big coupling constants and one small coupling constant. What do we call this pattern here? A quartet of doublets. So you have in roughly one to three to three to one ratio four little doublets. And if you wanted to be fussy about it, you could say, well, you know, my quartet isn't quite perfect. I can see these two aren't quite the same, or they're one's a little fatter than the other. 
you know, because all four coupling constants may not be exactly the same, but they're the same within a hertz or half a hertz, basically the, within the line width and the limit of digital resolution. So if you didn't like to analyze it as a QD, you could call it an apparent QD. I'm fine with either. I think either of these accurately reflects what you see. And here, if you said, you know, I kind of sort of see a little humpy thing over here and over there, you could call it an apparent, so I'll write or apparent TD. I'm happy with either analysis on this. All right. So, and you'll notice this peak simplifies the quartet of doublets simplifies, which makes sense because that must have been the proton that was coupled to the NH group because we lose that coupling. So that quartet of doublets now has become a TD or an apparent TD. Be well, it's not deuterium. Remember, even though you're getting a minuscule amount of DCL, let me put it in numbers. This sample is 50 millimolar, roughly. We have maybe generated 0.5 millimolar DCL, but that DCL is enough to catalyze the exchange. So now this NH isn't sticking around on this molecule. Every millisecond, this NH is bumping into another molecule and trading partners, or every millisecond, this molecule is bumping into an H, a little bit of the H2O in the sample and trading partners. Typically, when I prepare a sample like this, I pass the solvent through flame or furnace-dried alumina to remove traces of water and DCL first if I want an ice spectrum. Or DMSO D6 is another good solvent because it hydrogen bonds nicely and typically keeps your OHs in place by stabilizing them. So carboxylic acids that are hard to see in chloroform often show up well in DMSO. Question? Uh, I was just saying, like, wouldn't the water help the, like, the clear trash can, but we still have water in there, so wouldn't... And the water, so the water could help the exchange, mm -hmm. but apparently not enough okay. that it actually, you know, that proton actually does stay in place very nicely, and it's just when you get some acid in the sample. A singlet. So we would call this a broad singlet, B R S. And then the Q D is becoming a T D. So okay, great question. The Q D is becoming a T D. And remember how we teetered on the edge here between being a triplet of doublets, and you can kind of see a little bit of humpy stuff? All the three J's aren't exactly alike. They're all different sorts of protons with their own specific dihedrals coupling to it. So there are some differences. And so depending on the shimming of the instrument, one day, one time it looks like a TD, and the other time this looks like a DDD with two very, very similar coupling constants. So we can just at this point see eight lines here. And so at this point, just due to chance of the shimming, we're able to resolve the two coupling constants that differ by about a hertz, so it becomes a DDD. That's, this is purely, purely coincident. If I had had this with slightly less good shimming, it would have looked exactly like that. All right, what I want us to do now that we've thought about this a little bit is to extract the stereochemistry from here. So we, by figuring, already actually happen to know then that this proton here corresponds to this one. This one here corresponds to that one. But even if we didn't, we'd be able to figure, even if we didn't have this spectrum, you'd be able to figure that out by the amount of splitting that you see. OK, at this point, I want us to focus on these lines. I want us to extract our coupling constants. And I'm going to show you how I, how I handle my own data. I've made things bigger on the back. So this is a peak printout. I'm a big fan. You get this from a, second, a separate command on the spectrometer. I'm a big fan of getting these peak printouts because 
in addition to giving you the frequency of each line in ppm, it happens to give it to you in hertz, which of course you can calculate just by multiplying the spectrometer frequency. But the other thing that's really useful is it also gives you the peak height, so that if you have little stray peaks or if you have either an impurity or non-first order coupling in there, you can pick out your main peaks. Here everything happens to be very, very straightforward. So that first multiplet, the one that's the triplet of doublets, has six lines to it, and so I'm just drawing a line with my pen. The quartet of doublets has eight lines to it, and the doublet of doublets has uh, two lines. Uh, pff, the doublet has two lines to it. All right, so remember our analysis of a triplet of doublets. We split with a big J into a triplet. In other words, we have two of the same big J, and then we split each of those lines further into a doublet. And so we get this one to two to one pattern where the lines on the outside are relative height, half the lines on the inside. And if I called my lines, if I called my lines one, two, three, four, five, six, then the distance of the big coupling is one to three, it's two to four, it's three to five, it's four to six. What did I say? One to, one to three, two to four, three to five, four to six is our big J. And one to two, three to four, and five to six is our small j. And you can see that here. So we're dealing with real data now. What I showed you before was simulated data. All those lines were exactly the same distance apart because it was fake data, because it was a simulation. So now, to get the most accurate value of our j's, remember, you've got digital resolution, you've got the fact that your two coupling constants may not be exactly identical, but we can't extract them separately because we're not seeing separate lines. Turns out on that later spectrum where you did see the pattern resolve into a DDD, I was able to extract them. You'll get practice, we got practice with a DDD, remember, one to two and seven to eight is your small j, one to three, and six to, six to eight is your medium j, and then one to eight minus big j, medium j and small j is your big j for DDD. But here, all we can do is extract it and analyze what we see, which is one big j and one little j. So okay, to get the most meaningful data out of here, I'm going to take all of those numbers and average them. So get a sharper pen here because it's a lot of writing to do here. So if I take these and I've jotted it down, normally you could do this with a calculator. So I've jotted it down here. The one to three is 12.282. The two to four is, I'm sorry, it's 10.282. The two to four is 10.253. The three to five is 11.154. And the four to six is 11.280. And those are our big J values. So what I'm going to do is average them of all of that, of all the one to three, two to four, three to five, and four to six. And I got the average is 10.7 hertz. And now I take one to two, three to four, and so forth. And the average of those is, well, let me get the numbers, 4.065. 4.036, 4.162. So the average of those is 4.1 hertz.
All right, so if we wanted to report this peak the way I would report this peak to tabulate it to give us the short story is 4.38. I'd call it a TD or an apparent TD. Maybe because I'm seeing that there is some deviation here, I might call it an apparent TD. J equals, whoops, put a comma there. J equals 10.7 and 4.1 hertz. And I didn't go do the integral here, but if I did the integral, I mean, I did it, but not now, it would be one hydrogen. Thoughts or questions at this point? I take, the, I take the average of it. I want to show you something now I like to do. I like to take that peak print out and throw it into a spreadsheet. You will find on most of the problems that I have assigned, I actually have a digital version that you can highlight with your cursor, paste it into Excel or whatever spreadsheet program you use. This one happened to have been done a while ago, and so I didn't, uh, didn't do that but it's very easy if you can slap the data in a spreadsheet. Even if you can't, I'm a huge fan of this. So somebody help me out here because if I make a mistake normally, I proofread. I'll just do 11.87.921, and you'll see how quick and easy this is. 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11.83, 11
The next one we can describe as a 3.90 QD or a parent QD if you prefer 10.3. Since it really did look like that analysis was completely on, I'd call it 10.3, 4. Point, oops, J equals 10.3, 4.2 hertz, 1 H. And usually if I'm being good, particularly with my computer, I will separate numbers from units. So I will separate, uh, put a space in here, and I'll put a space in there, because you separate numbers from units, and the space here, and the space here. And the last one I didn't do, but it's our doublet. It's 3.41, and it's a D. That's just the difference between these two lines, which happens to be 9.5 hertz. And that ends up integrating to one hydrogen. All right, thoughts or questions? The nitro next. What's that? I guess I, I wanted to know what the value is for between, between the two ones. Let's let's find out. So now we've extracted our data. Now it's time for us to analyze our data and figure out the stereochemistry of the molecule, and also to think if there are any any conformational issues. So generally, when you have a problem where there are two possible answers, the best way to approach it is to go ahead and to try one answer, see how it fits, try the other answer, see how it fits, and see if you can distinguish them apart. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a cyclohexane ring. And let's start with the transstereoisomer. And if we have the transstereoisomer, I'd assume that the favorable conformer would have the two substituents in the equatorial position. Now, I wouldn't have known this a priori in terms of the conformation of the amino group, but that NH coupling was pretty big. That was a doublet with, with 9.5 hertz. That's consistent with an antiperiplanar conformation. Remember, that's not stereochemistry. That's conformation. But I can be pretty darn sure that it's realistic to draw this like this. So thing that I know right now is this is our doublet with J equals 9.5 hertz. All right, if we have this molecule, this proton here, how many big couplings would we expect to it and how many small couplings would we expect? Two, uh, anti two antiperiplanar couplings. So we have this axial proton giving an axial-axial coupling to this one and an axial-axial coupling to this one. And so, OK. And one axial equatorial. So we would expect it to be something akin to a triplet of doublets with the J of the triplet, the big J of about 10, and the little J of about 3. And so what we see here is actually a TD or a parent TD with J equals 10.7 and 4.1 hertz. Those are the data that we extracted. And that seems, seems to so far be pretty reasonable. 
All right, what would we expect for this proton? Somebody else. Three axial couplings. So we would expect, and again, we wouldn't a priori know whether I'd expect a big coupling or a small coupling or no coupling at all to this NH. Depends on the conformation. If you draw the phenylalanine, it actually makes a hell of a lot of sense that it sticks out like this. Um, you know, in other words, that it really does push it anti, anti periplanar. But a priori, I might not know what to expect, but I'd expect at least a big coupling from this guy to this guy, axial axial, and at least a big coupling from this guy to this guy. And we know from the J of the NH that at least in the fresh spectrum, the fresh sample, we have big J there. So what other couplings would we expect to it? One axial equatorial. So, this one here, we would expect to see as something like a QD or an apparent QD. And we'd expect to have three big couplings. And what we see is J equals 10.3 and 4.2 hertz. Now, coupling should be mutual, and coupling is mutual, but as I said, your line width and digital resolution each are about a hertz. Digital resolution is actually a few tenths of a hertz. Line width is probably about, about 1.2 hertz. But within the limits of the digital resolution and, more importantly, the line width, we're not getting a separate splitting here. Ditto over here. We see 10.7, which within the limits of experiment is the same here. In fact, you could see that we were kind of teetering no, on the no. edge between that uh, QD and a DDD type of, or seeing some of our additional splittings, because you could see all those spacings weren't equal. But we couldn't resolve it any better on this. So we see a QD or an apparent QD with 10.3 and 4.2. And this is what I'd report and it's consistent with these data. But now we also need to think, this is super, super important, because think about this. You start on a total synthesis of a natural product. You do a key step that gives you stereochemistry early on in the synthesis, and you make a wrong conclusion. And now 20 steps later, you finally get your natural product, except it doesn't match the published spectrum, and then you're in trouble and you're ready to graduate and you find out that your, your synthesis of isn't going to be titled total synthesis of hard complex molecule, but rather total synthesis of epi hard complex molecule. And that's not nearly as good. So this is really, really important to get this right. OK, let's take a look here. So imagine for a moment that instead of having the molecule as the trans stereoisomer, we had the molecule as the cis stereoisomer. And I don't know if the nitro group's going to want to be axial, or if the nitro group's going to want to be equatorial, or if I'm going to expect some conformational <coughs> mixture rapidly equilibrating. But let's start with the premise, maybe, maybe it would be axial, and let's think things through. I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that the trans is all equator is both equatorial, diequatorial, because diaxial would be the ring flip, and that would put two big substituents axial. But here we have a nitro group and an aniline group, and they're both kind of big. So what would we expect to the, for this proton, alpha to an, a nitro group, alpha to an axial nitro group? Three equatorial couplings. So what would you, what would you expect that to be? Like a quartet with what sort of J? Something like three hertz. Q, I'll say it might be an apparent Q. 
something that looks like a Q, J equals, I'll say approximately equal, little squigglies, three hertz. So that would be our prediction for this molecule. Three equatorial, oh, axial, uh, equatorial, equatorial, about three hertz. Equatorial, axial, about three hertz. Equatorial, axial, about three hertz. Now here's the cool thing. Let's suppose you couldn't even resolve the multiplet. Let's suppose the multiplet was a little broad and misshapen. You could look at that multiplet and say, so let's say for a moment that that multiplet looked, now let me give it a little more structure than that. Let me, let's suppose our multiplet looked like that. Not pretty like a snake that had swallowed an elephant or something. <laughs> all right, you could go ahead and say, all right, I can't get a peak print out on this thing, but I can measure this distance with my cursor. If that distance looks like it's about 12 hertz, that sure as heck is not consistent with this one here. Because this one, even if you couldn't resolve it, even if you couldn't exactly pick it out, what would that distance be about? About 25 hertz, because we'd expect it to be 10 or so, plus 10 or so, plus 3 or 4 or so. So in other words, we're using the number 10 hertz, which was just sort of the number I wrote on the blackboard, or 8 hertz or 9 hertz, I would expect it to be at least 10 plus 10 plus 3. Two big couplings of about 10 hertz each, and one little coupling of about 3 hertz each. So that molecule, even if it didn't give me its coupling constants precisely, would scream at me that it was consistent with this and not consistent with this. Now, what would we expect to see for this proton here? Let's assume that we continue to have coupling to this NH, and it's about 10 hertz. What would we expect to see here? Two, so two diaxial couplings, or all right, good. So we would expect to see it as, how would we describe that pattern? A triplet of triplets. Or TT, or something that looked a heck of a lot like it. Now, I don't like calling this an axial coupling, because that's special. I mean, it's, it happens that we happen to have it be big here, but it's not really axial on here. But you can think of it, I mean, because it's not on a ring. It's not axial on a ring. But we see it's big. Anyway, the point is, you would have one big coupling on the cyclohexane ring, one coupling to the NH that, in this case, we happen to know is about the same size, and then two small couplings. And so our pattern would look like one, two, one, two, four, two, one, two, one. They, they couldn't, so great question. So the question, for example, is why do they not split differently? And the answer is they could split different or the same 
if the dihedral angle is similar, then you will see either the same or very close to the same. If the dihedral angle is different, you'll see different. It may be, and we saw how this was teetering with the spectrum, where coupling constants that were the same within about a hertz weren't quite resolving apart, 11 and 10 hertz, 9.5 and 10.3. So it might be that this pattern, instead of being a Q, could be a TD or a DT or a DDD with three small j's. For example, it could be a DDD with 432, and that would be consistent with this, or a TD with 3 and 2, or a DT with 2 and 3, or 4 and 3, and that would be consistent. So three small j's no matter what. All right, I want to play with this idea for a moment longer and ask the question, what would happen if my assumption about the aniline group being equatorial was wrong or was incomplete? And so I'll do a ring flip and imagine for a moment that my aniline group is axial and my nitro group is equatorial. And so if we had this conformer, so these are both cis. We have two different conformers here that we're considering. So let's take our proton alpha to the nitro group. What would we expect for this proton now in this conformer of the cis diastereomer? One axial. So it's this one to this one, and two equatorial partners. So one axial-axial coupling and two axial-equatorial coupling. So how would we describe this proton here? A doublet of triplets. DT, or apparent DT, and what would we expect their J's to be? First name for the coupling constant, that for the multiplet is doublet. So that's the big split. 10. 10. Four, five, something. something, yeah, 3, 4, something, something like that. So we would expect it to split with a big J and then split into a triplet with roughly a small J. And so the pattern you'd see is something like one, two, one, one, two, one, with this distance here being three, so three, 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 and ten. And this guy here. And let's assume again that we still have a big coupling to the aniline. So the one that's alpha to the nitrogen here, what do we expect for him? Too large. So I'm assuming we're large to the nitrogen. That's kind of a wild card. And then who are its coupling partners on the ring? The axial, so this is axial equatorial. This is, uh, is equatorial equatorial. This one, so what are we? No, 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 no. 
we have, I'm assuming we're big J to the nitrogen. Let's assume, let's just assume because we happen to see that that NH was split. So I'm assuming that's a big J. What are all of our other J's? All small. So, so this one we would expect to see as a DT, as a DQ, or apparent DQ, depending on how it is. And this one we would expect to see the big J3 and the small, the big J10 and the small J3. All right, last thing I want to do. All right, let's call this cisconf1 and this cisconf2. Now, imagine that we had an equilibrium, which you may very well, a conformational equilibrium. There are two big substituents between cisconf1 and cisconfirmer2. And that equilibrium is going to be rapid because ring flip on a cyclohexane is rapid. And I just want us to think now about one of these protons. Let's just talk about what we would see for the proton that's alpha to the nitro group, which I'm going to call H sub A. And what I want us to think about is it's coupling specifically with proton B, proton C, and proton D. We'll call B and C the ones that are on the methylene group on the back, D the one that's on the methylene group on the front. And so B is axial, C is equatorial here, and this is D. And what I want us to do is think about what we would observe if we had a dynamic equilibrium between conformer 1 and conformer 2. What would we expect? So if we look at JAB in conformer number 1, it's about 3 hertz because it is an equatorial, equatorial coupling. If we look at JAC, it's also about 3 hertz because it is an equatorial axial coupling. And if we look at JAD, it is also about 3 hertz. And that's why we said that proton was a quartet. In conformer number 2, if we look at it, JAB now is very different. It's about 10 hertz because AB is axial, axial. AC is axial equatorial, so it's still about 3 hertz. AD is axial equatorial, so it's about 3 hertz. So now, if we are somewhere in the middle here, not all conformer 1, not all conformer 2, we would now expect to see one coupling constant that's somewhere between 3 and 10 hertz, and two coupling constants that are both about 3 hertz. So we would now expect to see this as a DT, or an apparent DT, or something that showed two bi one big coupling and two small couplings. In other words, a J big of 3 to 10 hertz. If it were right in the middle, we'd say about 7 hertz. So that might be my first guess. And a J small of about 3 hertz. So regardless of whether we had the cis as one conformer, the cis as the other conformer, or the cis as a dynamic equilibrium in which both conformers are present, our observed data of a triplet of doublets with 10.7 and 4.1 hertz strongly matches the trans and does not match the cis. So that gives us our stereochemistry. All right, we will 
pick up next time talking about other aspects of structure in uh, NMR. And specifically, I guess we'll talk about coupling involved in other nuclei.